Welcome to the Onyx Report, a program that critically analyzes the experiences, histories, and perceptions of black males in American society. I'm Dr. T. Hassan Johnson, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Fresno State, black male advocate, and black male studies scholar. In the program, we examine current events while engaging concepts ranging from institutionalized anti-black misandry to gynocentrism from a black masculinist perspective. Our goal is to remind people of black men's humanity. Call in after a half hour to the show at 310-928-7733. All right, all right. Welcome back to the Onyx Report. I can definitely say that today we are back by popular demand. Um, <laughs> to, with my my guest, who I will uh, reintroduce in a moment. Although I can, I think I can say at this point to my listeners that there's no introduction needed, but we will nevertheless do that. Um, but as you know how we do, especially since we for now are only recording twice a month, I like to give people a little bit of a taste of some of the current events that uh, really, uh, for me, kind of shape. Uh, in some respects, what, what black men especially are dealing with uh, on a day-to-day basis in different contexts. Uh, so I see things that shoot out at me in the news and in film, and um, I'm, I'm getting to a point where I, I see too much <laughs> and, and we don't have enough time to get into all of it. Uh, so for many of you who do follow my social media, whether it be uh, Facebook or Twitter, those are the two that I, I tend to be on. And most of that, mostly even my Twitter comes out of conversations on Facebook, you may have uh, seen some of these articles, uh, but uh, especially for those that haven't, just to kind of put it on your map so you're you're aware of some of the things that's happening. Um, these are not in any particular order, but just uh, things that I noticed that have jumped out at me. Um, so first things first, if we look at the Daily Mail, uh, there's an article out on a death row inmate, age of 49, whose quadruple murder convictions were overturned four times and ended in a mistrial. Um, uh, it, it ended in a mistrial twice. Is freed after 22 years on bond, and the prosecutor who barred black jurors is trying to have a seventh trial. Um, so if this is something you've not really heard about, you might want to dive in and check out uh, the story. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is dealing with a, a black male in Mississippi. Um, and um, let me see, uh, and it, the name of the gentleman is Curtis Flowers. Uh, so check that out. It's an article in the Daily Mail. Uh, also, we have, um, uh, uh, this is a post inspired by a, a listener of mine, a supporter of mine named Kyle Riesland. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Kyle. Um, but he nonetheless, um, he lives in Canada. And in a conversation that was happening on one of my posts, um, you know, a, a good colleague of mine was mentioning how much better it was in Canada. And Kyle jumped in and said, no, that's not necessarily the case. And so we found and he posted an article on Canada's black incarceration problem, uh, particularly with black men. Uh, and one of the things that he pointed out was that, uh, you know, black folk make about 2% of Canada, but are 10% of its prisoners. So there's some similar practices there. This is on TorontoIst.com. Uh, you can check that up. There are 70% more black Canadians in federal prison than there were 10 years ago. What are we doing about it? So that's, I, I believe, the title of the article. So check that out. Also, just got notification um, on one Crystal Kaiser. This is a young black uh, woman uh, who was uh, forced to be a Wisconsin sex slave at 19. And she's facing... Um, spending the rest of her life in prison for killing the man who raped and sold her for sex. Um, now, I post this one uh, not only because it's it's just jarring, um, but lately there have been a lot of conversations on my page about human trafficking, sex trafficking. Um, and so we don't hear enough about what's happening to black women, but we hear even less about what happens to black men. And as a matter of fact, many black males who are suffering from both human trafficking and sex trafficking. And um, we've seen some reports on this last year on, on uh, African men from Israel to, to, to Europe who are being trafficked. And it's also happening in the United States. Much of the time, it's not classified as sex trafficking when it happens to boys and men. It's usually classified in terms of slavery, slave labor, but often that includes a sexual component. Um, so it, it, the lines can tend to get blurred based on the language we use uh, but nevertheless, it's important. Um, 
So that's something to check out. Also, uh, shout outs to rapper Scarface, um, who ran for Houston City Council, Council in Texas, uh, got an impressive 40 percent of the vote, even though he did not win the seat. But shout out to him. And, and hopefully he will continue to do that. Also, uh, Arizona black father um, was accused of killing the man who tried to enter his teen daughter's restroom stall and was given an eight year prison term. I don't have an update, so I'm not sure if anything has happened since I've seen the title of this article, but um, I posted this because there were in the last few years in some of my posts, uh, my discussions online, ample um, accusations that somehow black men don't protect their women. And I've, I've posted ad nauseum article after article about black men who have. Uh, nevertheless, I posted this one as yet another example uh, of something that men around the world do quite readily, and that includes black men, despite how in many instances it's suggested that we don't. Um, so there's that. Uh, the name of the gentleman, this was published four days ago on fox5atlanta.com. Uh, um, the defendant's name is Melvin Harris, 41, accepted a plea deal on a manslaughter charge after initially facing a second degree murder, murder charge in connection with the 2018 incident. So I guess that's the, the recent update on it. But again, you can go to Fox Atlanta 5 or fox5atlanta.com and the article's title is Arizona Dad Accused of Killing Man Who Tried to Enter Teen Daughter's Restroom Stall Gets Eight Year Prison Term. Um, I can tell you um, I would be in prison as well. So I don't blame him in the slightest. Nevertheless, uh, those are the type of, type of protective measures that many black men engage. Also, we got a, a, an article on fox40.com that posted on December 13th uh, about a case in Stockton where a black mother and son uh, were arrested for trafficking a missing Bay Area girl. Now, part of the reason I bring this up is when it comes to human trafficking, sex trafficking, uh, prostitution, pimping, there's a narrative that I often ask my students for and every year they can give it to me that uh, black men just pimp black women and this is the end of it. But what you'll actually find is when it comes to human trafficking and sex trafficking, that there's a startling number of, of women that are involved in this. This is not something that is isolated to black men. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a paper on Link uh, Springer that I can, uh, I can give some more information on, uh, especially when I post this on YouTube that shows that worldwide, 38% of suspected perpetrators of human trafficking are female. Women from Central Europe and East Asia are even twice as likely to be suspected of human trafficking than men. And that's up to 68% of women there versus 32% of men. So this is a very nuanced and complicated issue. And in the African-American community, what we see with prostitution actually begins not long after slavery uh, as a means of survival. And there is a long history of black men and women engaged in this. And you see this even in the lives of certain celebrities like James Brown or Richard Pryor, whose parents or really grandparents in many instances were involved in this industry. And many of them were run by women. If you look at Richard Pryor's life, for example, his grandmother was actually a madam and she trained her sons as pimps. This is not an isolated occurrence. This is something that was in many instances done out of survival, yet nonetheless was not isolated to men doing something to women. This is a dynamic that's far more broad and nuanced, and yet the way we talk about it only implies that somehow this is something that you know violent, monstrous men do to each other. Um, now I have about six or seven more articles. I'm not gonna go through them all, uh, but suffice it to say, there's plenty of information out there that really does exonerate black men of the arbitrary accusations that are made against us. And yet much of the time, we just don't have uh, the, the proper mode of interpretation and analysis to really see what the arguments are and how they can be thrown on their heads. So that's why we do the Onyx Report to really arm people with information about um, how to look at the lives of black men and what we're overlooking and what we're missing. Now. Um, my guest, who, if you've seen this post on YouTube, you know that the comment section was on fire, um, mainly from a lot of people that wanted uh, to to bring him back. And my only reply was, that's only he, if he's in the country, because uh, <laughs> the brother is all over the place. And, and I introduced him last time, 
as a storyteller and one of the things he let my audience know is that that was only the term that was really one of the main terms he could use to give people here in the west a framework a starting point to at least understand some of what he does but that's only the tip of the iceberg there's much more to what he does and even much more to the storytelling itself that goes into what he does beyond that uh, one of the things that I like to, to to brag about him on is he's been all over the world uh, several times over all countries in South America I don't know how many people I can say that about um, and in Central America Costa Rica El Salvador all throughout Mexico Senegal Mali Gambia Ghana Guinea uh, he's been to France Spain Germany Poland Roman Romania Bulgaria the Middle East he just got back from Qatar um, Beijing, China, Jamaica, the Domin Dominican Republic, the brother's been all over the world after having started his own business 24 years ago, teaching himself, what, at least three, how many languages, three or four? Five. Five you see what I mean? See Five. what I mean? I, it, every time, man, I, it, I, I, I talk about my brother like this and people just look at me. This is the kind of uh, cat that inspires me um, and he, I don't know if he realizes how much he does so, but uh, the world, the brother is world renowned, multilingual, um, and there's nothing like seeing a brother, with, especially an African American brother, on stage in another country speaking the native language, and, and doing it fluently, and then you know getting on a plane coming back here, and fo folks have come, no come idea. On, come on, brother, that's enough, man. <laughs> come on now. You, you, know you, I mean? you taking this on way too far. Just, just you know cut, cut it short, brother. This is why I do this. This is why I do this. Because I want black men especially to get into the habit of celebrating each other. And we don't. You're right. And we we don't. don't. We don't. We don't not know a, how to do enough. that. We come out of a legacy, if anything, of competition. And, and if anything, putting each other down. And this is something I think I mentioned before. Uh, in terms of uh, Dr. Joy Degree, you know, Leary's work on um, uh, the, uh, what is it, uh, post-traumatic slave syndrome. She talks about how, you know, often we'll put each other down so as not to, uh, you know, increase uh, white folk in particular's interest in using right. us, selling us, so on and so forth. So we've developed these habits without really thinking them through, and now we just do them. And in many ways, they're toxic and negative. And so I want us to get into the habit of celebrating one another because much of the time we work in isolation. And for those that do achieve, they achieve in isolation. They're so not true. necessarily celebrated. So uh, true. You know, I can tell you the day I got tenure, which was like a 16 year process. I remember. Um, I, because I, I called you. I, I, yeah. I stopped by a comic book store, I got a couple comics. And and I think I got some uh, some lemonade and I went home and just chilled. You know, and there was yeah. nothing wrong with that. But it wasn't exactly what I had matched. There, there was no parade for Dr. Johnson, was <laughs> there? <it? laughs> there was no parade, especially with something that you you spend years going after and you don't even really think it's going to happen. You just kind of you just keep you know one foot in front of the other, and the next thing you, you know, you, you you achieve something. But often the accolade is the accolades aren't there. The celebration isn't there. Uh, and you don't even really know how to always celebrate for yourself. Right. And this is this is not unique to you. I this uh, uh, this is almost every brother listening can See. identify with what we're talking about, because when it comes to when it comes to black men in this society, our accomplishments are will always be diminished. Mm -hmm. And our accomplishments will always be compromised. So, you you know, it's like the brother who made the movie uh, Nat Turner, right? Mm -hmm. The brother made a beautiful made movie. Yeah, made a beautiful movie. Mm -hmm. But there were those who sought to tarnish the the film and his image. with, And they had to search high and low to do it. But they did it, didn't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those who, again, follow me on social media know... I take pictures of the theater mm -hmm. when I walk in. And here in Fresno, I went to see that movie and I took some students, but I went to see it maybe about six times. And each time the theater was bone empty, bone dry. Mm -hmm. uh, here in L.A., I went in L.A. and there were uh, there was a 200 seat theater. There were four people in there. You see that. And tell me, did you ever think you would see a Nat Turner film, a big Hollywood well, Nat Turner film in your life? 
Well, I, I thought if I saw a Nat Turner film, it would be based on the William Stern novel. Not, right. not yeah. I, I never thought that I would see uh, a black masculine figure figure on the screen um, mm -hmm. pro protecting and projecting his own agency. No, I, I, I really never thought that. I didn't. That. So, so, so again, I, I, I may do too much, especially for any of the brothers I interview. I try to big them up and give them the stage mainly because I know, you know, in many instances that that doesn't happen. Like for you, it bothers me that you're more celebrated around the world than I think you should be here. Um, now, that's just my opinion, you know, but I'm like. But that's you know. but brother, Dr. Johnson, that's a part of our historical narrative. Exactly. If, if you start studying the brothers in the past and this is what this is one of the led things that led me to construct my business, my business plan was I studied Paul Robeson, mm -hmm. okay? I studied uh, Frederick Douglass and his trips abroad. I studied Baldwin and what he was doing abroad. I even, like, I, you know, I even got into Malcolm and what he was doing when he traveled. I wanted to know why it was when all of these brothers traveled abroad that they had these completely different experiences. And don't forget also, we're steeped in the research from the 20s and the 30s of you know brothers like J.A. Rogers who in sex and race talked about how uh, black people were treated differently around the world so I had a base understanding of this mm -hmm. when I decided to make my business plan and another thing uh, that made me lean in the direction of looking internationally was I knew domestically that I lived under a under an oppressive system that no matter how brilliant I might be, it was going to try to compromise me in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. So if I looked outside of the country, then I could grow my own wealth, my own being, my own spirit, my own soul without having to be compromised. And a lot of times I'll say, you know, when we allow ourselves to be um, housed within the borders of this U.S., we're allowing ourselves in some way to be domesticated mm -hmm. here. And, and because this is what we call a domestic versus international structures. But I, you didn't want to get it. I, we just went off on, a, I just went off on a tangent, <laughs> brother. I'm sorry. Man. I'm sorry. I, but this is your I show. No, 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 no. There's no such thing. We deal with it as it comes. And, and this is actually how we live, you know, day to day. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, I've been trying to put forth in the last month is uh, really two months the, is the concept of what I call the sacred black masculine. Um, and, and what I'm talking about there is that there is a way that we can actually pay attention to black men in the world who are actually doing the things, living the ways that are constructive, that are actually, you know, beneficial. Um, especially the family and, and those in need. And yet, as we've, as we've, as we've been talking about, uh, they're not regarded. And so I've actually termed this sacred black masculine and I've posted examples of everything from black men who are helping people to black men and historically who've done things that they've not been lauded for. And, and I do that because there is an active push to put up a very, a very particular construction in people's minds, a very particular construction of, of black males as animals, as monsters, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And this promotes, you know, a dehumanizing view of black males, but one that is so deep seated in, in terms of what people believe that it's 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 shocking. Um, and it's gotten to a point that I think is highly problematic, especially in the social media era where um, the dehumanization of black men has is gone into, you know, uh, you know, just a whole different level, uh, you know, where it can be widely spread on a micro level. Right. Anyway, So that being said, um, I want to go back to really the 1980s and 90s in your life, mm -hmm. you know, before you really formally started, you know, your business as, you know, in this manner. And, and I want you to tell us about who Jellaba was what he grappled with at that time and and how you overcame it yeah i think and this is important for us to do because a lot of times we hold our cards close to our chest right mm -hmm. and we don't share information in the way that a lot of people do 
Mm-hmm. And I think this keeps us from being as successful as we can be as men, right? Mm-hmm. So um, what what I want to say is this. Jelly Bob didn't exist at that time. Mm-hmm. I was a young man struggling in this country during the Reagan era. Mm-hmm. Okay? I came of age in the, the Reagan era. And <clears throat> like a lot of brothers, you know, we we have our <laughs> we have our proclivities, <laughs> mm. if I could say that. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I ended up uh, getting a, a woman pregnant at the time, and at that time in the '80s, those who were around, they are going to understand what I'm saying. There were very few paths to success or opportunities available to us. Mm-hmm. So I was literally struggling. I mean, you know, I was back in that day. I was like 19, 20 years old. Man, at one point in Houston, Texas, I was selling vacuum cleaners. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. hustling. Exactly. I was hopping on the the transit system carrying vacuum cleaners because I didn't have a car, you mm-hmm. know. And I was mm-hmm. making it across town, and you know, and then when I and the, I had little side hustles that I was trying to do, like repair cars and, you know, Mm -hmm. run errands for people, whatever I could do to make money, because the Reagan era was no joke. Mm -hmm. I don't care care what anybody tells you, Mm -hmm. but uh, I think we're seeing elements of it again now. But yeah, go ahead. Oh, to yeah, to the extreme. But to advance this story, here's here's the point I want to make about this, because what we really need to talk about is when we when we start talking about systemic racism, okay? Mm-hmm. You don't get into the intricacies of how it actually functions. Mm-hmm. So as a young man, I did not know what I was fighting against. OK, mm-hmm. I had no idea. My conditioning told me if you work hard, you're going to be a success. All right. Right. And if you work yourself to the bone, you're going to be rich. Right. Mm-hmm. And us also with that, as long as you believe. Right. As long as you have some spiritual foundation and you believe, you will prosper. I think today they call it prosperity gospel, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that that existed at that time. And my mindset was sort of, you know, I got a child. I'm Mm going to take care of my child. I'm going to be a man. Mm -hmm. What I did not not know at the time was that the the playing field wasn't level. Mm -hmm. The definition of manhood was based on something external to me and my community, but I wasn't aware of that at the time. Right. I, I believed in the myth. Okay? okay. So I believed in the myth. So needless to say, selling vacuum cleaners wasn't putting food on the table. Mm-hmm. All right. Right. And uh, not to denigrate the woman I was with at the time, but... Um, she wanted more. Mm. She wanted so much more. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't know at the time was that because the playing field was not level, and I can't even say that because the deck was stacked against me as a young black man. Sure. Okay. I wasn't prepared for the things that were coming to me. So when when we talk about systemic racism, uh, it was Jim Crowism is there to keep me in my place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the last thing a fish sees is water, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't see it. Um, and needless to say, our relationship began to deteriorate. Mm-hmm. But what mm-hmm. I wasn't, what I was not prepared for was the level of vitriol mm. and, and the complicity that she was willing to go to... Um, partner with the system okay in order to have her needs met Mm. Um, and i'm not being euphemistic here i'm trying to find a way to say this where it's a way everyone can understand so i ended up uh in court battles yes uh for custody of my children and this was the 80s Mm. um i'll say this and then i'll answer whatever questions you want because i think brothers have certain things that they want to know but it took me years but i successfully fought and won custody of my kids in the 80s good god but what i had to go through 
Mm -hmm. What I had to go through, I literally had to walk through hell's fire to right. do that, to do it. Right. And right. there's a lot of brothers out there right now nodding their heads because they know exactly what I'm talking about. Let me let mm -hmm. me give you, let me give an example. Okay, I was young. I didn't have a lot of money, and attorneys will suck you dry. Mm. Um, so uh, during once I had gotten the the lay of the land, once I started to understand that no one was going to help me, I needed to help myself. I, right. st I started spending time in libraries with law books to learn mm. what the system was, the custody and the the state issues and what child support payments, how they were set up. And so I started studying all those things. Mm. And I remember my last case, the case where I won custody, it was in South Carolina of all places. Mm. I was Dang. in South Carolina. Mm. And I, I was interviewing these attorneys and every attorney I interviewed said, why are you fighting for custody? Mm. And in fact, I got there was one black woman who told me I had a case that was going to lose. But if I wanted to pay her to, to represent the way I told her I wanted to represent, she would do it. But she told me I was throwing my money away. Wow. But, she, but brother, she was willing for the money to do what I told her to do. Mm. So I wrote my own briefs. I wrote my own orders. I, I wrote everything. The sister, all she had to do was stand up in court and repeat what I wrote on paper. Wow. That's all she had to do. During the last court case, she's, this sister is sitting in court who I hired, right? And this is kind of funny. She's sitting in court, and the judge is looking through everything that I wrote up, and the case starts to turn my way. Mm. And the sister, the attorney, turns to me, and she says, it looks like you got a chance. Wow. But remember, she didn't believe in me. She mm. didn't. She didn't prepare anything. She had the degree. I didn't have the degree, right? right. So right. she, I used her to represent me in court. But they thought she had written everything. Mm. But it was me who had written all the briefs. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The judge in the end said there was such a compelling case. And he gave her all this credit for her brilliant briefs. And the sister sat there smiling and cheesing. And then when he, when the judge threw the gavel down and gave me custody of my kids, that was all I needed. I didn't mm -hmm. need the credit for the mm -hmm. case. Right. I need the credit for the case. What I needed was to work the system to my advantage to make sure that my kids were cared for in a way that they needed to be cared for. And this was the 80s. I mean, there's uh, there's so much more to the story, but mm -hmm. this just demonstrates what brothers are capable of when we understand, when we begin to understand what we're dealing with. Well, but tell me this, though. Um, since you got custody, was there an issue of child support? Or well, initially, <laughs> initially, now we're going back a lot of years, so you're kind of challenging my memory a little bit, but I remember... I got a call from the um, L.A. District Attorney's Office, mm. and I never will forget this call. I got this call, and uh, so you had, mo you had moved to L.A. I, well, we had lived here. Okay. She had taken my kids to uh, South Carolina, and I had to go there and fight for them. In fact, I used to. I used to go back and forth to South Carolina so much. I didn't live there. But I remember one, at one point, the teachers in the school said, we see you more than we see your ex. And she wow. lives here. Wow. Wow. But, but the, the other thing I was going to tell you, because you asked about child support. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I was, when, when I got custody of my children... I was here in L.A. and I, I got a call from the L.A. District Attorney's Office. And I mean, this was the nastiest, most vitriolic, just this guy was like telling me how disgusting I was. And and he wasn't letting me get a word in edgewise. And mm -hmm. he, was with, he was with the uh, child support division of the DA's office. So he goes on and on. And I said, sir, 
I need to stop you. You're not going to stop me. And he's just going on and on. He's just digging. And then in the end, he says, we're going to have a warrant for your arrest mm. if you don't come down here. And I think he wanted me to um, fill out an, an affidavit or it was something ridiculous. But when he finally ran out of breath, I said, what I've been trying to tell you for the past 15 minutes that you have gone off on me is that I have custody of my children and I have been caring for my children. So if you're calling me about child support mm -hmm. from my ex-wife, I understand that. But I don't know. So anyway, he's, he said, wait a minute, um, hold on. And I hear him shuffling papers. Right. Right. And he's so now the tables are turned. So I started to tell him, you are calling me from the district attorney's office and you are demonstrating your level of research and your level of investigation into what you were supposed to check into. I said, this is problematic. And I said, I started going into him. I said, I have custody of my kids. I don't have time to tell you how to do your job correct. So, I, you know, I turned the tables a little bit. Wow. But the thing is, when it came time for her to have a child support order, she got minimal. Do you not look? This was eighty. Hold on, maybe eighty-seven or so. Mm -hmm. I had two children. Eighty-seven. She had to pay fifty dollars a month per child. Hmm. Hmm. And that wow. was it. And that was it. Wow. And and did she get that vitriolic phone call? I'm just curious. No, she never did. She did. She, she did. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, you know, that's reserved for us. That's well, for us. And, and that's part of that's part of why I want to read a section um, of, of, of a paper um, and then kind of, you know, show you something that I've seen in social media that pertains to this very issue. Not necessarily child support, but the treatment of black men in a very particular way. This is actually from uh, the ISIS papers. Uh, Dr. Francis Crest Welsing, and it's it's a it's a bit long, so I apologize in advance. It's probably about probably about a whole page, so bear with me. Uh, but Dr. Cran uh, Francis Crest Welsing says, critical in the history of white supremacy was the decision not to control black and other women of color, but to control the men of color. Men are the initiators of the act of reproduction. Ultimately, women are dependent upon their men for protection because of the greater physical strength of men compared to women. If one simply controls the men, men of a people, the women are controlled also. Thus, the white collective went about the business of systematically developing a plan and power mechanism worldwide to bring all of the world's men of color under their ultimate control. Once this was established, the men of color were informed overtly as well as subtly that if they ever should seek to alter the power relationship of white over non-white, they would have to fight and many would die. Thousands upon thousands of black men in the U.S. were lynched and castrated to drive home the message that white men intended to control the balls, in quotes, in this world, both on and off the court. White males understood that they needed white women as well as black women to help them achieve and maintain this power relationship. White women always have known what they stood to gain, their own survival as whites. Black women have been confused and less clear in fully understanding how they have been led to cooperate in this deadly power game of white supremacy. Further, black women do not understand fully that they have nothing to gain and everything to lose if this deadly game continues. The first lessons to black women were harsh and cruel ones of sexual assault and abuse, taking their children away and forcing them to watch their men be lynched and castrated. But then these harsh lessons were followed by milder treatment of black women as compared to black men. Black women were given extra food, money, clothing, and other gifts for their special personal favors to the masters. They were rewarded for correctly teaching their children to conform to the master's wishes, as well as for telling their men to calm down and be patient so that they too could be rewarded. Perhaps we, black women, she says, really became seduced by the illusion of power being so close to white males. We've told ourselves that these behaviors were survival tactics and the only way that we could have come this far but as our survival increases, increasingly is becoming threatened, we are forced to wonder if we have been mistaken in our analysis and our strategy. But again, there is something to be learned from our African past, as we must never forget those who do not learn from history, their whole history, are bound to repeat it. Now, that was Dr. Francis Cress Welsing from the ISIS papers. Mm -hmm. And the reason I read that is, uh, is a colleague of mine sent me a tweet 
um, posted by a sister on Twitter. I don't know yet the legalities. I should have asked my engineer before we got on if I can even state names. So I'm not going to give the, the name. <clears throat> I have it. I have, I have pictures of the tweet. So if I find out that that's something we can do, I can make that, that information available. But I will read her tweet because I think it relates. So this is, uh, this is dated uh, December 17th, 2019, 1.39 p.m. She says, no babies until a nigga put me in a new crib and car plus ring on this goddamn finger and a hundred thousand inconvenience fee, hundred thousand dollar inconvenience fee for getting me pregnant during my prime plus my BBL and surgery for new titties right after I give birth. I will not be compromising. And then someone else, and then she says, ladies, y'all go shop. And then the next person who's another woman writes in after that, all these men saying she's asking for too much. And then she has a laughing emoji. She said, worst case scenario, she doesn't find someone who will give her this. So she continues flourishing because she's choosing not to have a baby by a dust bucket. Where's the negative? The reason I mm. read that, especially in relation to Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, is because I've seen this and I've heard this in person. I've seen it on social media by the unlettered as well as the advanced degreed. I've heard mm -hmm. this perspective come about where men are essentially viewed as um, I mean, we, there's a saying where, you know, we talk about women being viewed as sex, uh, sex objects mm -hmm. by men. Mm -hmm. But we often don't talk about the fact that many men are viewed as success objects. They are objects for other people's advancement, especially in the dynamic of men and women. So in that respect. Uh, what we have going is that men are seen as a means to an end, and that's somehow acceptable. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to dehumanizing men and making them into ATM machines or what some refer to as uh, unpaid bodyguards, all of a sudden there's nothing to be discussed. Well, there's a sinister aspect to this that we have to – I mean, I, I can appreciate what you just read, but beneath this, there's a very sinister aspect – that racism creates that mm -hmm. we never ever discuss because see look let's be honest let's be real about this as black men we will never okay discuss black women in a in a derogatory negative inflammatory way because our conditioning has taught us that black women are our goddesses Okay, mm -hmm. this, this is I'm talking about our conditioning. Mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. just bear with me. Mm -hmm. just bear with me in this. So our conditioning t t has us whisper when there are things that we need to say about our women. It has us close the door when there are things that we need to say about our women. But mm -hmm. here's here's the sinister aspect of racism, what it has done. Okay, mm -hmm. and this is not. Please do not write in and tell me I am not that type of sister. I don't do this. That I don't know women. Look, this I'm going to tell you what exists. What exists is an agent for the other in bed with us at times. Because there are an innumerable number of brothers out there who can attest to the fact that when they get into conflict with their significant other with the baby's mama, with whatever you want to call it, that mm -hmm. one of the first things that woman will do is align herself with the system and say, mm -hmm. if you don't do such and such, you are going to pay. Mm. And and this is how this is how disgusting it can get. This is how disgusting it can get. I have seen women who when they get into it with their brother with men, when they get into it with them, I have seen them call the police and say he has a gun Yeah. when yeah. the brother doesn't have a gun. Now, yeah. what that tells me is there's some psychology here at play. What that tells me is there's a psychology here at play, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Willing. Now, what does a woman who calls the police on you and say that you have a gun when you don't have a gun, what is she expecting to happen? Hmm. Hmm. I mean, tell me, what is she expecting to happen when they arrive? Yeah. So all I'm saying is we have a dynamic that we have not been able to address effectively because we don't put these discussions on the table. Well, we're not we're not allowed to have them, really. We're not allowed to have them. 
and that I think between you and my generation, um, I think is you know because I'm I'm definitely Generation X. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was I was in grade school uh, in the '80s during the time frame you're talking about. But I can definitely say with my generation, most of us uh, were, were raised in single parent environments, and, and that was overwhelmingly single mothers. Mm-hmm. And I think what many of the boys learned uh, was a hostility toward the absent fathers or, or fathers who didn't live with us. And we learned to revere mother. Mm-hmm. And, but a, a little more than reverence, I think what we learned was that she was beyond critique. And by she, I don't mean necessarily our mothers literally, although it includes our, that. Our archetype of mother. The, the archetype of mother, but the also the archetype of woman, the archetype of, of women. In many ways, you know, one brother described it to me. We, he felt like we were being, you know, prepared uh, to be uh, – to, to be handed off to another owner when we reached adulthood. It was a weird kind of dynamic. But what he's what he was referring to is the conditioning process of 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 putting women first, not critiquing, not knowing how to. There was even a, a skit done on the Key and Peel show where they're talking about the black women, you know, there there's two men having a conversation about their women and and they're whispering to each other. You know, and, and I think it had something to do with with calling, you know, the, the women or using the B word in relation to women. I don't, I don't remember the specifics of it, but they whispered every time they got to it and they would move to further and further locations away. Uh, and then, you know, Kim peels out out of it. So they're in space, I think, at one point doing it. But what they were talking about was that black men's speech and thought, you know, was something that had to be overseen. Mm-hmm. And it had to be something that we were allowed to do. And to the extent that it wasn't, many, you know, didn't know how to, still don't know how to. So the conditioning you're talking about is developed in childhood and continues on into adulthood. Yeah, it does. And and so when you have this one-sided critique where people have, men and women, have no problem talking about the debauchery of black men. But when we talk about it with black women, it's kind of a, we don't, you know, we, it gets a little questionable when people start getting quiet. But, we start but, choosing our but, words very carefully, you know, but that's, that's comfort, not that same type of care for black men. No, this comfort of talking about the debauchery of black men, the missing black fathers, it is all mythology. Mm. This is all mythology. Mm. There are no numbers to back up the majority of what many of these people are thinking. Mm. Black men are in the home more or with raising kids than any other race in this country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when I, when I say myth, what I'm saying is this society has a construct where it has a need for a monster. Mm -hmm. All right. In this construct, the need for the monster, we have been relegated to that need. So I don't care how many facts you put forward. I don't care how much information you put out. You are never going to persuade a vast number of this society that we are human beings and i know this may sound inflammatory to people and i know some people will say he's being hyperbolic but we are literally as black men the frankensteins of this society Mm -hmm. we literally are now you you said something a moment ago i want to build off of because you said no matter what the numbers and the reason i want to say that that was important is because when you talk about being the frankenstein being the boogeyman there is an after effect of being seen as a boogeyman in a society like, you know, like American society. Mm -hmm. And that after effect can actually be measured empirically where it is justifiable for black men to be killed, Mm -hmm. to be dismissed, to be mistreated. And it's acceptable because we're the boogeyman. And even in our own community, even amongst black men themselves, we tend to be oblivious Mm -hmm. to, to what we, you know, what we've experienced. <clears throat> so in terms of so there was a, a couple of, of, of online posts that I made to try and speak to this. Uh, the first of which I think did we talk about suicide last time? No, but can I put this brother's name out because I want to put this elder brother's name out because okay, um, there was a brother in uh, the 1940s. His name was Vernon Vernon Johns. Oh and yeah, he, he was a minister of uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist, Baptist Church. Church, right yeah. in Montgomery. Now, look, and I'm I'm just using this as an example. This brother, his last sermon that Mm -hmm. he did basically was, it's all right to kill Negroes or it's illegal to kill kill Negroes. Now, 
when he did it, he was responding to the deaths of many, so many brothers in the counties that surrounded Montgomery. And it was happening at such a pace that he was frustrated. Now, when he put the sermon together, his congregation told him, do not tell that, do not put that sermon uh, in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. Don't speak, don't tell. He, he not only put the sermon out, but mm -hmm. on, the, uh, on the board outside of the church, he put, it's all right or it's okay to kill Negroes. Now, mm -hmm. what, you have to, what you have to understand about a brother at this time doing this in Montgomery, Alabama, which I think most people would say he, he had a, a, a nerve that many of us don't have today. But what you have to understand is Dexter Avenue Baptist Church is just a couple of blocks away from the Capitol. So mm -hmm. when people were passing this church and they were seeing on the on the sign of the church what the sermon was going to be, that means everybody was seeing what he was putting out. Now, here's why I say this. Here's why I say this. That was one of his last sermons. Mm -hmm. OK. The preacher that they bought in after him. Who believed in love and pacifism was Martin Luther King, Jr. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. OK, so I'm saying this to say our voices, our voices as black men are always marginalized, minimized and drowned out when we speak our truth. Mm. When we, and, and I can take it from that level to how many brothers out there right now, when you pull up to work, you turn your radio down on your car because you don't want any of these people to hear the kind of music you bumping on the freeway. Right. You know, there's a right. whole lot of people. There's a whole it's a, a lot of right. brothers exactly what I'm talking about. Sure. But that music is your voice. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. When you pull into wherever you are employed and you have to turn down that radio, it's not it's not much different than what Vernon John went through when he had to not give the sermon and he gave it anyway. And absolutely. Is what I'm saying making sense? No, absolutely. And, and for those who don't know about Vernon Johns, there was actually a film made called The Vernon Johns Story. And Vernon Johns himself was played by James Earl Jones. Uh, so check out that film. If you don't know who James, uh, who uh, Vernon Johns is, check out that film. And there actually is they, they do the scene that you're talking about in regard to the speech or to the sermon. So I, I would like people to be able to see it to drive that point home. So check that out. Look for the Vernon John story with James Earl Jones. Um, but, oh, I just got a notification that Trump was impeached by the House of Representatives. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll see what that actually means. <laughs> I, I can't. You're not going to hear me jump up and down with joy. You, you see that? I, I, you will see. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'm not interested. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not even going to explain. It's yeah, not more time. Go it ahead, is not though. about supporting him. It's about the, it, yeah, the, what it's, does that actually mean on what the ground? Because, mm -hmm. you know, once once the Mueller report comes out, this is going to turn everything around. You know that, right? Well, I'm looking forward to oh, see. Oh, what wait, wait. The Mueller report came out. And what happened? Nothing. All right. So let's keep talking, brother. I just anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but what I was saying about numbers a moment ago, what I was trying to get at is when you look at the black male experience, because we've been boogeymen, the treatment and, and, and our, our overall experience is allowed to be such. And most of us, let alone our own community, will not really know about it. Um, so, for example, um, in, and I have the sources for this. I'll try to remember to put them in the low bar on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, please make sure you go on to Patreon. I'll put the link there as well and support the show. Uh, give it a likes up, a uh, thumbs up and, and like the, the, the show so we can go ahead and get this out. But if you look at some of the data that's come out, right, we talk about the top 10 leading causes of death in the black community. I didn't remember if I had brought this up last time. No, so, if I, so if you I did, did, forgive me. Um, I'm an, I'm an old teacher. I sometimes repeat myself. But when we look at the top 10 causes of death, there have been some major shifts um, and some consistent shifts that many of us don't really know about. Uh, and that's basically one of the main things is that um, for years, black men tend to die at much younger ages, even than black women. Um, and, and it's usually not until after the age of 65 that we start to see black women die at greater rates. Now, why am I comparing black men and women? Well, because if it's just a black issue, the issues and the date and the stats would be the same. 
But there is a qualitative difference between black men and women, and it, that difference is also reflected in black men's relationship with the state, with society as a whole. But because our issues tend to be more dramatic than even black women's, according to the data, that suggests that there's need for a di dialogue and analysis about black men that many of us are shunned and shamed into not having. So I continue in terms of the top 10 leading causes of death. Heart disease has always been number one across race. But we tend to uh, we tend to notice that black women die from heart disease at at greater numbers than black men, even though it's usually past the age of 65 and a significant number of black men are already dead at that point. This year, for the very first time, top 10 leading causes of death from 1999 to 2017, black men exceed black women in heart disease. And, and, and this is something that we, again, haven't seen happen like this um, to this degree, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that to me is, is kind of a terrifying you know, moment. But nonetheless, in terms of heart disease, uh, in terms of malignant neoplasms, which is cancer, um, uh, cerebrovascular, actually cerebrovascular is less. So heart disease and malignant plasms and homicide, we're seeing black men dying at, at extremely high rates, especially compared to black women. Now, this is interesting mm -hmm. because when you talk about the differences between us on the top 10 leading causes of death, there are two things on black women's chart that are not on black men's and two things on black men, men's chart that are not on black women. When we look at the charts, Alzheimer's and influenza slash pneumonia are two thing, things that black women die of at, at, at higher rates than black men. As a matter of fact, it's on their top 10 causes of death. For black men, it's homicide and HIV. And there's a age correlation between those two. Absolutely. Because one of, one of them you're talking about dying at a much uh, later stage of, yes. of age and yes. the other you're talking about much younger. Absolutely. All, Alzheimer's and influenza slash pneumonia are things that really don't impact until after the age of 65. Exactly. So when you're talking about homicide for black men, homicide affects us from, listen to this, from ages 1 to 54. Homicide is an issue and it's most dramatic between 15 and 44. So 15 to ages 15 to 24, we die. There's been 49,733 black men killed. Uh, from from 25 to 34, there's 41,845 black men killed. From 35 to 44, there's 20,557 black men killed. You see what I'm saying? The yeah, homicide I, rates are extremely high at very young ages. You need you need to put the numbers of black women um, killed by homicide next to the number of black men killed mm -hmm. by homicide so that we can have the conversation sure. uh, in, a, in, a, in the way that we need to have it. Because well, what typically happens, what typically happens is the, the spotlight will focus on the rate of, hom not just homicide, but statistical numbers as they relate, relate to black women. And then oh, yeah. there will be all sort of, sorts of resources allocated towards the preservation and towards upending whatever is happening statistically with black women. But when you look at the numbers in correlation to what is happening with black men, there's an imbalance in the numbers, but all the resources go in one in the other direction. Well, absolutely, because if you because if you look at it from 15 to 24, about 5,486 sisters died. Uh -huh. 25 so, ages, ages 25 to 34 is about 5,551, and, and then, then and then ages 35 to 44 is 4,523. So okay. the numbers I just gave a moment ago during the same age ranges, you know, uh, for 15 to 24 it was almost 50,000 brothers. 25 to 34 is almost 40,000. 35 to 44, it was over 20,000, as opposed to 5,000, you know, here and there. So that those are that's just one example. Yeah, but brother, I think what look the most astounding to me, the the one that set me back was was uh, suicide rates. Oh, talk I'm about, about to get those, to that. I'm right, about talk, to get to that. Talk, talk, spend time on that because that's important for black men to talk about. Well, this came up because again, this is one of the things that get buried, gets buried in the conversation when we decide we're just going to talk about black. And, and it's interesting what happens here. Issues that affect, you know, black men just get buried under this moniker of black. But if they're if they affect black women, we get to separate that out. And that includes the academy. Mm -hmm. That includes the academy. So you can have conversations about gender, but only as it pertains to women who have had extreme experiences. If it pertains to men, it needs to be kept under the auspices of black. And I've had this experience writing uh, journal articles 
right? Journal essays. And I've had editors tell me, you, you, you can't say this about black men. You have to label this a black problem mm -hmm. unless you're talking about black women. So in terms of suicide, one of the things I point out from the same time frame, 1999 to 2017, 18 years, what we've seen with suicide is there's been about 3,294 black females, because it's across age, that have committed suicide. In the same time period, there's been about 23,295 black males who committed suicide. Almost 20,000 more to the okay. number. Let's just stop for a moment, because I, I, I didn't know you were going to go, and I was hoping you did, and I, hope, I was hoping you had those numbers. But let's just stop there for a moment, but let's just think about that. All right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 23,295 black men. Mm -hmm. die of suicide mm -hmm. in that same period 3,294 black females die of suicide mm -hmm. okay now here's what happens when we attempt to have these conversations okay the voices of opposition rise up and say why are you comparing numbers there we go. Why why right. are why are you saying that someone's pain is greater than someone else's pain? What mm -hmm. difference does it make whether it's black women or black men? The voices of opposition rise out and what happens is it drowns out the actual discussion we need to have. Yes. Because what happens what happens in this society is the number 3294 black women they will have all sort of governmental resources allocated to mm -hmm. that number okay mm -hmm. to that number and you will have women's clinics opened up you will have therapies th uh, therapy centers for women you have wellness centers for women black women opened up and there will be money and, and resources allocated to this i mm -hmm. know about this because i worked in this realm okay mm -hmm. now when we decide that we want to discuss the twenty three thousand two hundred ninety five what happens with that is that number gets rolled in with the 3,294, and we don't talk about black men or women. We nope. talk about black people. Right. And then you get somebody like Tyler Perry, who's looking to help the homeless, who prioritizes women, children, and LGBT groups. Who do you think he's not prioritizing? And there's another place we need to talk about the disparity in numbers of in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The number, the number of homeless black men. Uh, you, oh, come on, brother. We got. Well, it's but see, but that's it's actually in major urban centers when where you have black people. It, not only across race is it more men, but especially in the black community, especially when you factor right. in those coming out of incarceration, even when they have housing vouchers, can't get into can't get proper housing. These constitute the majority of the black homeless, and yet there's no critical discussion about that. So the same numbers that we're seeing affect us in terms of suicide, affect us in terms of homicide. Because again, and this came up in a discussion online where I had, uh, somebody sent me an article on Twitter and, and, and she was trying to say, well, you know, look at the rates of black female homicide. And I just, ba I just gave her the raw numbers because people like to play with rates. Yeah, they do. So she was saying, oh, look at the rates of black female homicides, extremely high. And I, I gave her the number. There's 17,573 black women who have been killed, according to um, CDC. And this is 18 states reporting uh, in terms of black female homicide. But 134,574 black males that have died from homicide at the same period. Stop playing with numbers. Stop playing uh -huh. with it. 17,000 as opposed to 134,000. And you and I are made to feel ashamed for talking about the 134,000. Let me ask you one word answer very quickly. How many people in the community, especially black men, do you think know that about any of those stats we read? Brother, I will say none. We're going to close out right here. Thank you for joining the Onyx Report and we will pick up later. <laughs>